Okay, thanks, Dr. Flaxner, and thanks for everyone who stayed behind and still here for today. Um, I'm going to be talking, giving you a story. This is probably the most non-scientific talk that you will hear today. Um, I'm going to give you a story of what happened in the last few years, uh, particularly since um, the end of 2021 into 2022 and how fast a pace we worked. But I'm going to be speaking on behalf of some of our colleagues here. Uh, the, you know, our colleagues from Liverpool, including Say and Kadia, who worked a lot throughout the last couple of years, together with me, Alice Sang and her group from Ontario. And I'm just here because they asked me to come up and speak on your behalf. So I just want to make sure to know that it is a collaboration that we had created in January of 2021, uh, January of 2022 in response to the approval of Paxlovid or ritonavir boosted nemetrovir and what we have done since. As you all know, we all remember about the COVID-19 pandemic that in most countries started in February of 2020. And around that time, during the pandemic, many of us were involved in some way. There was an urgent need to react to situations and events with very little time to prepare. We have a common goal as far as our medical profession is concerned is to provide guidance to busy clinicians who are taking care of very seriously ill patients of an, an emergent infection that we know very little about as far as pathophysiology as well as how to manage these patients. We have very little scientific evidence to base our recommendations on, but yet we have to provide some guidance. Three groups in three different countries, continents, uh, actually two continents, um, got together in different ways to prepare the different guidances. The, COVID, the NIH COVID-19 treatment guidelines was formed in March 20, 21st, 2020. We put together our first guideline in two weeks and then released two weeks later. So within one month, we put together our first guideline. With most of our recommendations, there's insufficient evidence to recommend for or against something such as hydroxychloroquine. Liverpool uh, put together the first COVID-19 DDI guide, which is a PDF form in March of 2020. And at the same time, the interaction checker came out in May of 2020. Ontario Science Table, primarily not on DDI-related issues, but on how to manage patients, went live in August of 2020. So all three groups were already doing something for the treatment of COVID-19. Fast forward about one and a half years later, we're still living with COVID-19. We're still having concerns about how to manage these patients, but now we have more therapeutics, including um, the first in class of uh, ritonavir boosted nemetrovir or Paxlovid. Many of us remember that we lost the Christmas holiday and the holiday of 2021 because we are all working really hard and did not take any time off. November 26, 2021, the day after Thanksgiving in the US, the first cases of SARS-CoV-2 Omicron variant was reported. In December of 2021, there was a very rapid spread as well as significant surge in COVID-19 cases of hospitalization and deaths that were reported. In the United States, we only have authorized outpatient therapy with three monoclonal antibodies. However, two of the three were found to be resistant to, uh, to SARS-CoV-2 Omicron variant. So it was left with citrovimab that was available, but it was in very short supply. We knew that at that time that the FDA was getting ready to authorize two, first in, uh, two of the first oral antiviral agent, which includes ritonavir boosted nemetrovir as well as monoparavir. So we were all getting ready because the three groups know a, lot, a little bit about how to manage ritonavir with the related interaction, but we didn't know much about how to manage five days of ritonavir uh, treatment rather than continuous therapy like we do with HIV. So there are certainly a number of concerns about the use of ritonavir boosted nemetrovir. Uh, low doses being used, we are used to it, 100 milligram twice a day, but only for five days instead of chronic therapy. The initial product label, on the other hand, from Pfizer, if you really look at it, 
it was using the information from 600 milligram BID dosing. And if you really look at it, it also includes how to dose Emprenavir and Dilavirdine. And I was, well, the first time I looked at that label, I said to myself, where did they come up with this? The clinical trials itself did not include patients with significant DDI. It was indicated for high-risk patients, as Katia had mentioned earlier, um, who are uh, at high risk of progression to severe COVID-19. So that means they are, these are older people, people with many comorbidities, as well as uh, immunocompromised hosts, polypharmacy, and have very high risk of significant DDI. For now, it is going to be prescribed by providers that didn't know anything about retinavir. This is not targeting towards HIV providers. This is targeting towards primary care physicians who had never dosed retinavir or used retinavir before. So there was an urgent need to have some user-friendly tools that would be able to use by the public. So this is the beginning of the cross-Atlantic collaboration that started in December 2020, uh, 2021. So just to give you a, a timeline of what happened, December 10th, the NIH COVID-19 guidelines panel invited the Pfizer group to come to talk to us, particularly talking to the clinical pharmacology group and ask them about how they determine the drug interaction information that is available. We know at that time that the FDA is likely going to provide an EUA before the end of the month. Um, the NIH COVID-19 Treatment Guidelines Pharmacology Group, or the pharmacists that we have, are primarily pharmacists from the critical care, infectious diseases, pharmacists that are not taking care of HIV patients. We desperately need to have other um, uh, experts to join us. So I call Kim Scarcy. This is the first time I call a friend. Kim Scarcy was there, Jomi George from NIH, as well as three of the boys from the FDA. We figured that we need someone from the FDA to join us so that we can ask all those questions that we don't have an answer to. So the first group meeting that we had was four days later, December 14th, and we began to prepare our guidelines, guidance and try to think about what do we need to provide for the clinicians? What do they need to know? We were very interested at that time as whether the Liverpool group is going to provide the COVID-19 guideline at uh, retinavir booster nematravir in the guidelines. So I sent Kim Scarcy to say, now Kim, you have to call your friends. So Kim call Kadia and say, and um, say, well, the NIH COVID-19 treatment guidelines are going to be working on this guidance and we know that the FDA is going to provide an authorization. What are you guys going to do about it? So right away, the Liverpool team, Katia, told me that she mobilized her group to start writing the summaries and to prepare something that it will be released at the same time as the NIH guidelines to come out. So the US FDA, um, on December 22nd, they decided to do it before the Christmas holiday so that they can give us the work to do. Um, so they had pro uh, provided an EUA for retinavir boosted nematravir. Liverpool completed the first draft on that same day and used the uh, product label that they have to reconcile what they have. On December 30th, as you can imagine, we worked through the holidays. The NIH COVID-19 treatment guidelines panel come up with our first guidance, which we call the one pager, and Liverpool website become live at that time. So everything happened from December 10th to December 30th. In 20 days, we did all those work. So this is what happened. We come up with what we call one pager. We basically, for the NIH guidelines, we just provide some guidance as what drug you can use, what drug you, don't, you cannot use. And particularly with the guidance that we did not really provide that much information about what to do in those cases where you have to reduce the dose or whether you have to hold the dose. We rely totally on, we know by that time that there is a link to the Liverpool website, we provide them with a the link, and this came live with uh, retinavir boost in the become available, and we asked people to go to it. In one month, we have 102,000 hits to this particular page that we have in the NIH COVID-19 treatment guidelines. So now, January 2022 uh, um, came the Ontario group. So Alice Sang provided me with all the information that happened in Canada. Um, 
Alice went to uh, the Ministry, Minister of Health in Ontario and the Ontario Science Table to provide them with information that they need to put together something for the DDI resource. And she recruited 13 pharmacists in different specialty areas, including HIV, family medicine, emergency medicine, antithrombotic therapy, psychiatry, transplant, oncology, and infectious diseases to come together to put together the guidance. Health Canada approved ritonavir booster numatrovir on the 17th, a, a week later, and distribution occurred on the 24th of uh, January. The resource came out the day after um, the distribution, and it was published in the Ontario Science Table and University of Waterloo website. The, because we know that NIH COVID-19 treatment guidelines invited um, the Ontario group to join us to have a joint collaboration with the Liverpool group. And um, on the 28th, the EMA also conditionally approved ritonavir boosted numatrovir. So this is the Ontario science table, um, provided color-coded information about what you can do with the different drugs, but also provided more importantly, the recommendations and the comments for the clinicians to use. Again, we are targeting towards individuals who are not used to HIV, are not used to taking care of patients uh, that require ritonavir. So because we are talking Independently with each other, we, need, we thought that we need to put our heads together. So the three groups, as I mentioned, urgently and simultaneously prepare the guidance for clinicians. We're faced with the same challenges when making these recommendations, particularly thinking about which drugs can people use together safely and which drug can be stopped or whether you can dose reduce. But more importantly is when to restart therapy. And uh, I think Katia mentioned there are some discussions about whether it should be after two days, three days, five days. Um, after you stop the drug, can you go back to your original uh, drug? Which drug should not be used together with a ritonavir boost in the metrovir? And we know that with our guidelines, we constantly go to the Liverpool guidelines for guidance because you provided much more uh, detailed information than we do. And with the, vir with the benefit of virtual conferencing, by th that time we know how to use Zoom. And uh, we decided that we're going to meet together and January 31st was the first time that we have a partnership between the three groups. And since then we have been meeting almost monthly, I think for the first year, continuously meeting monthly with a lot of email exchanges so that we can share our ideas. So what do we discuss? Uh, we reconcile the areas where there are differences in our recommendation. We discuss about some of the differences that we have with the product label and how to deal with it. Because we have a member from the FDA in our group, we share our concern with the FDA that eventually led to changes in the label in the FDA because of some of the feedback we provided them. And Katia showed you already that they have statistics about what do people look at, what drugs are the most important drugs that the clinicians would go to. We share the statistics, we share our experience, both clinical experience as well as experience from clinicians using the, the, our website. We have to balance the need for providing useful information and not to discourage people from using ritonavir boost and numatrovir. We have heard a lot of people that says that they don't want to use it because they're worrying about the DDI. And the last question is how do we disseminate information to more people so that they know that the tool exists because a lot of people are not familiar with these resources. So our guidelines, the NIH COVID-19 treatment guidelines eventually come out and incorporate it into the guidelines itself when we divide them into four different drug categories based on the different color code you have, those drugs that you can use together with it, those that you might need to monitor more or you have to dose reduce or stop or you cannot use at all. One thing we did was we provide a lot of links to the different, uh, for the clinicians. And as you can see over here, those who go to other sources, 66% of them had visited the Liverpool site. 19% uh, go to the FDA information and 15% go to the Ontario sites. So we allow other people you know, to know that where they should go to if they want more information. Among the, Ever since we came out with this guidelines, the Paxlova DDI page was continuously, from the very beginning, become the most used page in our whole guidelines itself. 
So up until, uh, this is data from July 31st, we have over 2 million hits on just this one page. Next to it is ivermectin, don't ask me why. And uh, as you can see, um, the rest of them are down there. So the Ontario resources also try to disseminate the information to as many people as possible, and these are data came to uh, share with me from Al Singh, is that they distribute through email over almost 90,000 uh, pharmacists and prescribers from the different sources over here. And as Katia had mentioned before, over 10 million people had, uh, uh, I guess, hits for the different drugs um, within the website itself. What we realized, and we continue to share these data almost on a monthly basis so we know who used these uh, documents. And almost half of them came from the US, probably because of the large population, but you also have an international viewer. And this is so important to know that people are using these guidelines to provide guidance for the patients. Among them, um, and I think Katia showed some of these information already, among all the, all the cases that were looked at, 8% of them are in the red category, meaning to do not use. And then the majority of them are actually uh, cases where they can use uh, drugs together with it. And Kadi also shares with me all these other data. You know, um, as you can see, atorvastatin and amlodipine are the ones that are being used, uh, being viewed the most, uh, representing the population uh, that require the COVID, uh, treatment for COVID-19, and also the top red uh, drugs, including the statins and the DOACs. We continue to have monthly calls, as all well, bi-monthly call email exchanges. We review some, uh, several of the problematic drug classes, including DOEX, particularly immunosuppressants, cancer chemotherapy. Other than that, we use this forum to talk about other topics as well. Remember, August of 2022 was the time when there was an outbreak in the, in the US as well as in Europe of MPOPs. Uh, we started talking about what to do with ARV and ticvarimet uh, interactions. We started talking about what to do with Encitrovir DDI because it was approved in, um, in Japan and also clinical trials were underway. We invited a number of guests to join our calls, including the Pfizer Clinical Pharmacology Group, the Encitrovir study team, as well as the Clinical Pharmacology Group from Shinogi, uh, the trans transplant clinical pharmacist specialist, as well as anticoagulation clinical pharmacist specialist to provide us with real life information. We actually presented this data at CROI, and you can see we have the collaboration that we actually have a dinner, and say, and, and Kadi was there, but uh, Sophia Kirikas from NIH was the one that was the most instrumental in putting this group together, and fortunately herself and Alice were not able to join us at that time. On May 25th, 2023, just three, four months ago, the US approved um, uh, Paxlovid. On March 23rd, these data are presented to the antiviral um, advisory group. And what they presented, which was very important to us, was that there were a number of DDI-associated SAE reported to the FDA. Among them, 271 cases were from immunosuppressants, including four deaths associated with tetralimus. So that makes us you know, realize how important some of these data information is for the public. 45 cases were from calcium channel blockers and 21 cases from sensitive hypnotics. The product label now has a box warning for DDI. And there are a lot of debates about what to do with more than five day courses uh, of, is five days course long enough because we start hearing about rebound, we start he hearing about persistent prolonged viral replication, especially in immunocompromised host, as well as the data will be coming out from the EPIC IC study comparing three versus 10 versus 15 days of ritonavir boosted nemirtrovir in immunocompromised host. We talked about what are the DC, DDI consequences of longer than five days. Um, you know, I, I'm not going to go into these in great detail because Katia had mentioned about this already, but we do know that we do need to provide some guidance for the clinicians if they choose to use more than five days of therapy because the potential mechanism as well as the potential consequences could be very different. So when we start hearing a lot of our clinicians in the US are using more than 10, five days, more than 10 days, they are sending in expanded access protocol for 21 days of therapy. 
I went to Cardi and say we have to do something about it because our guidance was primarily based on five days therapy. And that led to the modification of uh, the Liverpool website. Uh, instead of just five day therapy, now we have a choice of putting in, if you are uh, giving the patient more than 10 days, what you would do. And this was released in July of 2023. So these are the last two slides. We have a lot of challenges and opportunities. We know that developing guidelines is hard enough when it is a stable time. It is even much harder during a pandemic and uh, when there are no data. And it requires really collaboration between different groups and all the parties involved, regulatory agencies, clinical trial teams, pharma and other policy makers, uh, practicing clinicians, guidelines developer, as well as the patients. Um, there are lack of clinical PK data making the development of the guidelines very difficult. Um, it's difficult to know about multiple interacting drugs, especially these patients are definitely going to be on those. The problem we face with, and many people have told us, is that isolation and quarantine really make it very difficult for us to monitor patients, especially for those who are in, on immunosuppressants. It's impossible for them to do DDM on those patients uh, when you don't have an ability to bring the patient out to go to a lab. And extended duration is you know, adding an, another layer of challenge. So what do we gain from this collaboration? It really allows us to sharing a lot of issues and problems so that we would be able to provide better guidelines for clinicians care, uh, caring for the patients. Sharing the Liverpool statistics really help us to understand what are the most important drug classes that we have to pay more attention to. Um, learning from each other's experience as well as ex expertise is important. We don't have all the expertise, but getting all the heads together really allow us to do that. It allows us to harmonize our recommendation and talk about our differences and why there are differences. If we bring in the clinical practitioners out there from different places so that we can hear about what the, the uh, issues that they, they have. And lastly, I think one thing that's very important is that this experience can serve as a model for future collaborations when and if there are new emerging illnesses in the future. So this will not happen without the collaboration of the three group that we all act together very quickly and collaborated very, um, you know, uh, in a very co cohesive group. And I'm listing the COVID-19 treatment guidelines at the NIH, the Liverpool group, as well as the Ontario Science Table Pharmacy group, which we all work together to try to, to do the best we can to help the clinicians out there. Thank you. Thank you.